Good morning and welcome to the Thanksgiving edition of the Kent Monthly In-Service. Uh, I'd like to take the opportunity to express thanks and gratitude for the wonderful job you all do taking care of our patients, uh, stepping up to provide coverage when needed, uh, taking care of our COVID-19 patients and everything else that you all do. Uh, this unit is the greatest dialysis unit in the Western Hemisphere because of all of you and uh, I'm forever grateful. Today we'll discuss uh, dialysis emergencies. Considering the complexity of the dialysis procedure and how sick many of our patients are, it is remarkable how rarely a life-threatening complication occurs during dialysis. And I think there are several reasons for this. Uh, for starters, um, there are numerous safety features built into modern dialysis machines. Um, second, uh, we have meticulous uh, water safety management uh, and dialysis solution preparation to prevent exposure to uh, trace elements, uh, toxins, and pathogens, so we're very grateful for the job that Joe does. Um, you all do a wonderful job adhering to detailed treatment protocols, uh, which uh, enhances the safety of the procedure. Um, and also you all have background in dealing with uh, emergencies, medical emergencies that handle the dialysis unit, which is very helpful. Um, so we're going to discuss several different dialysis emergencies today, uh, including dialysis disequilibrium syndrome, uh, venous air embolism, hemolysis, uh, venous needle dislodgement, vascular access hemorrhage, uh, and major allergic reactions to dialyzer or treatment medications. Uh, and finally, disruption or contamination of the dialysis water system. So all of these are potential emergencies that we don't see very often in the dialysis units, uh, but we should definitely um, recognize them when they happen. Okay, so the first one we're going to talk about is the dialysis disequilibrium syndrome. This is um, uh, an uncommon syndrome uh, occurring in patients with high BUN levels undergoing their initial hemodialysis session or, say, resuming dialysis after having missed several sessions. Um, clinical presentation is sort of nonspecific, you know, nausea, vomiting, headache uh, in mild cases, but it can progress to confusion uh, and even seizures in more severe cases. Okay, so here's the theory. Uh, basically, dialysis removes waste products um, not only from the blood, but also from our tissues, specifically from inside of cells. Now, BUN, or blood urea nitrogen, is removed from the blood faster than it is removed from the cells, including the brain cells. So during dialysis, uh, water moves from areas of, of lower to higher concentration, so for example, from the blood into cells, including the brain cells, uh, and then this makes the brain swell during dialysis, which can cause pain. Uh, as I said earlier, it can progress to confusion, seizures, uh, and even coma. Uh, there is no set BUN value above which uh, dialysis disequilibrium syndrome uh, predictably occurs. Um, <clears throat> it's been associated with BUN levels greater than 175. Um, uh, and also with aggressive dialysis, so removing it very quickly with dialysis. Um, additional risk factors, if you have pre-existing neurologic conditions, like if you've had a stroke before, or again, if it's your first dialysis session, uh, or also if you have a low serum sodium concentration at the start of dialysis. Um, clinical presentation, again, restlessness, headache, uh, progressing to nausea and vomiting, again, seizures and coma uh, in severe cases. Okay, so how do we prevent it? Uh, so the most important thing is to slow down the rate of urea removal uh, with a low blood flow and dialysis rate. So that's typically why we start with a low blood flow rate in a new dialysis patient. Um, you can also increase the dialysate sodium concentration. That is effective. Uh, the problem is it causes sodium retention in the patient, which can worsen swelling and blood pressure. So typically we manage this problem uh, by just starting dialysis out slowly. So in summary, uh, dialysis disequilibrium syndrome occurs from brain swelling and the setting of removing waste products too quickly, most often in a new dialysis patient. Uh, again, it, it can occur in patients who say miss dialysis for three or four sessions and then return. 
Um, watch for it during the first ever dialysis treatment of uh, cystic ovarian syndrome. Okay, the second dialysis emergency that we're going to talk about is venous air embolism. Um, this problem occurs when air is introduced into the venous side of the blood. Um, air bubbles can become trapped in the systemic circulation, either the pulmonary or even cerebral microcirculation, which can cause ischemia, so basically preventing blood from delivering oxygen to tissues. Um, it's a rare problem uh, in part because of the safeguards of the dialysis machine. Okay, so how can it happen? Uh, how is air introduced into the venous circulation? So there are four possible areas of, of air entry uh, into the dialysis circuit. Okay, so first when we administer heparin or saline. Uh, second, um, if you don't adequately prime uh, the system and get rid of all the air from the dialyzer or the dialysis tubing. Third, if you have a broken or loose lure connection between the arterial needle and the tubing itself. Um, again, remember that on the arterial side it is sucking blood and so it has negative intraluminal pressure and it can just as easily suck air into the blood. Uh, and finally, if you have a hole in the arterial tubing, uh, that also can suck air into the arterial line. Okay, how do people present? Um, so, essentially, if you get air uh, that occludes the blood vessels supplying blood to the lung, you can present with chest pain and shortness of breath. Um, if there is air in the pulmonary artery, uh, the right heart may have difficulty pumping against the air, leading to low blood pressure, uh, as well as a fast heart rate, again, in the air embolism in the pulmonary capillary band. Um, if there is a hole in the heart called a patent foramen ovale, air can escape from the right side of the heart to the left side and then enter the arterial circulation. If it goes to the brain, a uh, patient can present with symptoms of a stroke, like uh, blurry vision uh, or confusion, seizure, uh, weakness. Um, of course, patients can die from this. Um, it's thought that a volume of 100 to 300 milliliters of air is enough to be fatal. To, uh, to a human being. Okay, so how do we prevent it? Um, one, make sure the arterial lure lock is tightened. Uh, sometimes uh, uh, <clears throat> that's a problem. Um, you need to adequately prime the dialyzer the tubing. You guys do an awesome job with that. Um, <clears throat> maintenance of a high blood level in the venous air catcher. Uh, and then finally, this is one of the reasons why we avoid extreme high dialysate blood flow, like 500 uh, mils per minute, because it just increases the odds that um, uh, you can quickly uh, uh, <coughs> in, in, in suck in air and then just recumbent, yeah, left lateral recumbent uh, position um, could prevent right ventricular failure by moving the air essentially superiorly in the right ventricle so it doesn't go into the lungs. Um, but the dog studies that have been done on this suggest no benefit to this position. Uh, and supine position allows for um, better oxygenation and hemodynamic support, including CPR if needed. Okay, so in summary, um, venous air embolism results from either human error or equipment dysfunction, like the lure lock or a hole in the arterial line. Um, generally, uh, just make sure your connections are tight and that you properly prime the patient, and it should be a very rare. Uh, complication in dialysis patients. Okay, uh, the next uh, dialysis emergency we're going to talk about is hemolysis. Hemolysis is of the red blood cell membrane. So you can see all these normal looking uh, red blood cells in the photomicrograph. These are the round uh, red blood cells, all those are normal. But the arrows point to fragments of red blood cells uh, that represent uh, red blood cells whose cell membranes have ruptured, uh, releasing their uh, intracytoplasmic contents into the bloodstream. So why does this happen? So there are several reasons why hemolysis can happen in dialysis patients. The first one is shear stress, as red blood cells circulate throughout the hemodialysis circulate. Um, it is more common if a small needle, like a 17 gauge needle, is used, or if you have kinked dialysis tubing. Um, osmotic changes. So for example, if the dialyzer uh, is, uh, has a hole in it uh, or a structural defect allowing for the blood and hypotonic dialysate to mix, uh, then that will cause um, water and the hypotonic uh, dialysate to enter the red blood cells and 
increase pressure and cause it to explode. Um, of course, contaminants in the dialysate can cause hemolysis. The big thing that we, we worry about um, are chloramines. Chloramines in the water supply, uh, if not properly removed by the carbon tanks, can cause hemolysis, and that is why we check um, our dialysate, or, or basically the city water, uh, for the presence of uh, carbon after it removed, uh, for, for um, chloramines after it's removed through the carbon tank. Um, there are other contaminants too that can do this, copper, zinc, uh, nitrates, etc. All of which are removed uh, in the water treatment process. Um, hyperthermia is another problem uh, that can enhance hemolysis. Uh, basically overheated dialysate can cause thermal injury uh, and hemolysis. That's why there are dialysis, uh, dialysate temperature alarms on the machine. Um, of course, this wouldn't just affect a single patient. If there were a problem overheating the dialysate, it would affect multiple dialysis patients uh, uh, in a row. Okay, <clears throat> so the symptoms of hemolysis include nausea, shortness of breath, abdominal pain, back pain, uh, chills. Uh, management includes stopping dialysis uh, and do not return the blood because it may contain a large amount of potassium that is released uh, by the exploded uh, red blood cells. So in summary, hemolysis is rupture of red blood cells. Uh, think about possible causes again. Chloramines, could there be a bad dialyzer? Uh, is uh, the dialysate being overheated? Uh, and then most importantly, do not return the blood. Okay, the next dialysis merging we're talking about is needle dislodgement. This is a big problem. It still happens in every dialysis unit. Um, Actually, uh, hemorrhagic shock can occur quickly uh, if a needle becomes dislodged. Um, with typical blood uh, uh, dialysis flow rates of 300 to 500 mils per minute, uh, hemorrhagic shock can ensue you know, within a couple of minutes. Um, <clears throat> the major contributing factors towards needle dislodgement, um, improper taping, uh, don't think I've ever seen this in dialysis, you guys do a wonderful job taping uh, the needles. Uh, a loose lower lock, uh, I've seen that problem, so basically it's very important to make sure the lower lock is uh, uh, tight enough. Uh, Bloodlines not being looped loosely, this happens sometimes, uh, you know, patients turn or something like that, and if there's tension on the, uh, on the dialysis tubing, then the needle can come out. Um, access site not being visible, this is uh, probably the single most preventable uh, cause of uh, needle dislodgement, and also failure to recognize that a needle has become dislodged. Uh, and then finally, patient factors, you know, the patient just being really confused and uh, pulling out the needles, etc. Okay, uh, as an aside, you know, if someone pulls out the needles, there should be a, a precipitous drop in the dialysis uh, venous pressure, and that should set off an alarm, but it doesn't always trigger the alarm, so we can't rely on it. And that's because the venous pressure alarm is affected by other things. Uh, for example, um, intra-axis pressure, dialysate blood flow, blood viscosity, um, flow resistance in the tubing, uh, and also just the height difference between the axis and the venous drip chamber. So all of these factors uh, affect the venous pressure alarm, and so it doesn't always go off. Um, uh, and sometimes, or once there was a case where a dialysis patient pulled a needle, his venous needle out, and jabbed it into the dialysis chair. So there was enough resistance in the dialysis chair that it didn't set off the venous uh, pressure alarm. Um, so <clears throat> again, it's always very important that we be able to visualize the access uh, in case uh, the needle does become lodged. Okay, so how do you prevent this problem? Again, proper taping, uh, adequate tightening of all newer lock connections, uh, loose taping of blood lines so there's no tension, keep the access site visible. That is really, really important. Um, as an aside, in home dialysis patients, uh, we give them what are called enuresis pads, basically pads that are able to detect moisture, and so you put it underneath your arm, and if there is any leaking of blood, uh, it uh, will set off that alarm. Okay, the next allergic reaction we'll talk about, uh, next dialysis emergency, uh, allergic reactions. So allergic reactions um, occasionally occur in dialysis patients, um, and there are many potential triggers. Uh, these can include like the dialyzer, uh, the sterilizer that's used to, to clean the dialyzer, such as ethylene oxide, uh, the disinfectant for the water system, uh, medications that we administer, including heparin, iron, antibiotics, um, and blood transfusions uh, uh, also are common causes of allergic reactions.
Okay, in general, there are two types of allergic reactions among dialysis patients. Type A allergic reactions occur quickly at the beginning of dialysis within 5 to 20 minutes. Uh, they present with um, itching, hives, wheezing, trouble breathing, anaphylactic shock, and these are mediated by uh, a preformed IgE antibody. Type B reactions occur later in dialysis and are associated with uh, less intense symptoms uh, such as chest and back pain. And these are mediated by a component of the immune system called complement. Okay, um, now just as an aside, dialyzer reactions used to be common, but now they are rare. Uh, and why is that? Well, early dialyzers were composed of cellulose, which is a cotton derivative, and owing to their organic component, they activated the alternative complement cascade, basically part of the immune system, and were therefore considered bio-incompatible. So then, uh, the dialyzers were modified to add acetate side chains to cellulose, um, and this reduced complement activation, uh, making them making the dialysis more biocompatible. Uh, and currently, the Northwest Kidney Center, and frankly most dialysis users around the country, use synthetic dialyzers. Uh, these are uh, considered highly biocompatible because they only minimally activate the immune system or the complement system. So again, we used to see a lot of dialyzer reactions. It's important to recognize that they still can occur, uh, but they are now uncommon. Okay, so how do you manage an allergic reaction so you stop dialysis? Again, don't return the blood. <clears throat> um, in our dialysis, we can administer antihistamines such as Benadryl. Someone's having a bad reaction, of course, you call 911, and they can administer steroids and epinephrine and take them to the hospital. Okay, so um, in summary, allergic reactions uh, in dialysis patients can occur secondary to dialyzers or medications or blood transfusions. Uh, management includes of Management includes administering Benadryl, uh, considering um, 911 if someone has a bad reaction. Okay, water system emergency. So anything that disrupts the water system is a dialysis emergency. It can be something as common as a broken pipe. Uh, so for example, in Port Angeles a few years ago, a broken city pipe uh, disrupted water supply to the Dallas unit, which had to be promptly shut down until the city pipe could be repaired can also happen uh, from contamination. Um, <clears throat> so recall that dialysis patients are exposed to about 200 liters of water during an average dialysis session. Um, and the dialysis membrane is the only barrier between the dialysate and their blood. So it's of critical importance that city water undergo rigorous purification uh, before its use uh, for dialysis. Okay, lots of ways that um, dialysate can be contaminated. Um, big one again that we worry about chlorine, chloramine and chlorine. Uh, basically, um, <coughs> these are uh, <coughs> added to the sea water supply uh, to kill bacteria, uh, and they are primarily removed uh, by uh, the carbon tanks of the dialysis water system. Uh, as we talked about earlier, chloramine can cause hemolysis and um, methemoglobinemia in patients on dialysis. Uh, particularly if the carbon tanks become exhausted or if there's an excessive load of chloramines in the water supply that's being delivered to the carbon tanks. Um, hydrogen peroxide uh, used to be a problem for us uh, when we use it to disinfect the water storage tanks. Uh, and so we definitely have had uh, <clears throat> problems with uh, dialysis patients being exposed to hydrogen peroxide. Uh, again, it's usually removed by the carbon filters um, uh, and it can cause hemolysis, methemoglobinemia. Uh, from exposure. Uh, fluoride toxicity essentially um, can lead to uh, itching, headache, cardiac arrest. Fluoride is uh, present in the in most city water supplies, not all of them. For example, Auburn doesn't have fluoride in it. Uh, it's normally removed um, <coughs> basically by the deionizer uh, in the water system. Um, so if there's a problem with that, then fluoride can get into the dialysis. Okay, so in summary, um, any disruption of the water supply uh, is a dialysis emerging. That's, of course, where we have Joe, our FSS, without whom we would just close up shop and go home. So thanks again, Joe. Right, um, the last dialysis emergency we're going to talk about is a vascular access hemorrhage. Uh, this is a potentially fatal complication if not recognized promptly and acted on with appropriate intervention. Um, most um, 
uh, vascular access hemorrhage occurs outside of the dialysis facility, but occasionally fistulas can rupture in the dialysis unit. Um, patients and their family uh, really need to be educated about uh, recognizing uh, and uh, managing uh, bleeding AV access. Um, <clears throat> basically, uh, aneurysm is uh, a dilation of the arterial venous fistula. The wall becomes thin and prone to rupture. This is the number one risk factor for uh, dialysis hemorrhage. If a dialysis aneurysm were to rupture, uh, the treatment <coughs> is direct application of pressure. Uh, tourniquet if needed, uh, and then calling 911. Basically, these people need to be managed in, emergent, uh, in, in, in an emergent setting like the hospital operating room to, uh, to ligate the fistula. Okay, uh, it is now time for the favorite part of your talk, quiz time. So what are two types of allergic reactions on dialysis? That's right, type A and type B. Type A are the immediate reactions that occur early on in dialysis mediated by IgE antibody. Type B reactions are delayed, occur later in dialysis, uh, and represent activation of a part of the immune system called the complement system. Okay, name three causes of hemolysis. Excellent. Uh, there is uh, shear stress. Uh, again, as, um, uh, the dial as the blood travels through like a small needle, like a 17-gauge needle, or if there's kink tubing. Osmotic changes, again, if there's a defect in the dialyzer, allowing for hypotonic dialysate to come in contact with the blood. Dialysis contaminates like chloramines and chlorine. Uh, and finally, hyperthermia. So basically, the dialysis is overheated that can cause hemolysis. Name three ways that air can be introduced into the venous circulation. Very good. So inadequate priming. So if you don't get all the air bubbles out of the tubing or the dialyzer. Uh, if you have a broken or loose nor lock connecting the arterial needle and the tubing, because again, there's negative pressure in there and it likes to suck in air. Uh, there's a hole in arterial tube that can suck in air into the arterial line. Okay, a patient just started dialysis has a VUN of 200. He develops a headache and becomes confused. Your primary concern is? That's right. Uh, dialysis disequilibrium syndrome. So again, um, this is a uh, problem that most often occurs during the first dialysis treatment for someone who is uremic. Um, can, however, occur in someone who's missed several dialysis sessions. So in, in either of those cases, you should have a low threshold for considering dialysis disequilibrium syndrome. Okay, this is the main risk factor for AV fistula rupture and bleeding. Excellent in aneurysm. So basically, someone has an aneurysmal dialysis fistula, it would be very good for them to see the vascular surgeon uh, because it probably needs to be uh, addressed um, particularly if uh, it's getting bigger and there's increased risk of rupture. Okay, so this concludes the Thanksgiving edition um, uh, in service of the Ken Northwest Kidney Center. Thank you all for listening uh, and for making our Dallas unit uh, the best one in the Western Hemisphere. Hope you all have a great day. Bye-bye.